think we'll have a. Uh, uh, I think this will just let you go by a little quickly, though. Uh, so, quick announcement. So, there's a, a new uh, ICA that, if you choose to do, uh, is technically due on uh, before lecture B2, which is Thursday. This ICA, you have about 90 minutes to do. It goes over the stuff we've talked about so far, as well as a couple of the topics that come up in the chapter reading associated with uh, that, that ICA. Uh, lab 2 is this week. I know some people have already started on Lab 2. It's uh, the lectures available online, so you don't have to attend the lab physically, but you can if you'd like uh, extra help with that. Um, there's video assistance uh, is available for, the, for Lab 2, uh, and I'll put more, I think, on... Um, I already put a Excel spreadsheet, which is sort of a sample of the hand simulation that you'll do in Lab 2, but uh, I think I might actually record a video kind of explaining the steps of how you actually generate that solution set as well to provide a little extra help. But if you've looked at the video associated with homework B1, it's very similar. So the short hand simulation you do in homework B1 is kind of extended, um, and that's what you do in lab two. Uh, then uh, homework B1 is also available. It's been available. I think some other people have already turned it in. Uh, but it's due technically like a week from today. So today is the sort of formal day that it's uh, yeah, so for the bonus points on homework B1, yeah. is that literally just the same thing that we did in question two, but just in an Excel spreadsheet? Oh, so that's a good question. So homework B1 does have a few bonus points at the end of it. And so what it, <laughs> the next week, I'll show you some examples of how you can, you can do discrete event system simulation using automation within Excel. So the what you do in lab two and in homework B1, uh, at least the normal kind of regulation assignment without the bonus credit, is to do everything by hand. Now, of course, you could set up a spreadsheet that calculates things on its own, and then you just sort of fill down, and it does the simulation for you as you're filling down. So the extra credit is to build one of those, those spreadsheets, which I'll kind of go over next week, but it's also talked about in the lab. So for very simple discrete event system simulations, you can actually get Excel to do all the hard work for you. You just have to put it in this other format. And so that, like, whatever, I forget what table that is, like table 2.5 or something like that, whatever table I refer to in the bonus, if you go to the book section where they talk about that, it'll talk about how they build a spreadsheet to do that. And I'll actually go over how to do that in uh, next week's lecture. I think B3, I think I'll go over. Is that before homework two? That, I think, will be, so that's why it's bonus, is it? so that'll actually be due, it'll, I think it'll be due on the lecture that I actually talk about that. But if you read ahead in the book and you're willing to sort of be ambitious, then you can feel free to do it that way. But it's, you know, the, the required work is just the hand simulation. Other questions about the homework or the labs or anything? Okay, um, so, so yeah, so a quick recap from last time. So we've now introduced discrete event system simulation. Uh, it's discrete uh, event because we've got the system only changes at countable discrete instance of time, and those instance of times we refer to as events. So dynamical systems have state, state changes over time, and exactly how those state changes are sort of what defines the type of system. A discrete event system is one where the state only changes at instance of time called events, and those events are countable. You can count them one, two, three, uh, you know, they're potentially infinite, um, and that's where we get discrete event system. And so we're simulating these. We view these from a process-centric process perspective, which means that we don't think about the entities that uh, are running around in the simulation as having their own decision logic we think of them as being shoveled around processes. And so the actual logic that we'll program goes into where they're created, it goes into all the places that they wait, it goes into all the places that decide that some have to go around one way and some have to come around another way. So we are modeling the processes, um, and, and through that as well, I'll get into it in a second, that means modeling the activities. An activity is like waiting for another passenger to arrive, that's an activity. Waiting for a passenger to get done in security, that's an activity. So modeling the activities and stringing those activities together are what goes into modeling a discrete event system in a simulation. So entities, hopefully everybody feels pretty confident about entities right now. Uh, you've had a lot of practice on this, the lab one, the homework, 
Uh, so these are effectively the players that move around the simulation. You can view them as sort of passively being shuttled around these processes. They are dynamic. They get created. They can have attributes that, uh, that can be changed. I'll get to attributes here in a second. They usually represent real things. So, uh, you know, you can talk about parts in a manufacturing system, customers in a grocery store, students in a university. They're usually the tangible things that are moving around. Although occasionally, if you get really clever, sometimes you create virtual entities just for the purpose of programming. Um, as an example, you might be simulating an intersection. Some of you might pick an intersection for your final project, and you want to simulate the light timing. You know, it switches from going the north-south direction to the east-west direction. Well, some way that people program that is they generate an entity that is constantly cycling, cycling around a loop, and whenever it crosses a particular point in that loop, it switches the state of the lights. And so, like, that's, you know, sort of a clever programming trick that makes use of entities. And so, you know, there, are, there can be these funny little virtual entities, but mostly they're actually physical things that are associated with the real world. Um, you can have different entity types. Uh, so if those of you on your homework and in the labs, uh, you may have uh, said, well, you know, I'm having, having a hard time coming up with more than one entity. Uh, but you've come up with a lot of different attributes, which I'll get to in a second for those entities. Sometimes you can bubble that up and say, well, instead of giving one type of entity, entity multiple attributes, why don't I just create multiple types of entities? So I don't just have a customer. Now maybe I have an in-store customer and a mobile order customer. You know, now I have two types of entities. So you can have multiple types of entities, or they could be very drastic. So I could have passengers, pilots, and TSA agents, and depending on what I'm modeling, those all might be entities coming into the system. Those entities can have different attributes, so different color shirts, you know, different ID numbers, different reasons there they've arrived. Uh, so as an example, we often stamp entities with their arrival time to keep track of how long they've been there. Uh, we might have an assignment if we're simulating assignments that are going through a simulation of a, I don't know, a course. Um, those assignments have different due dates. We might give entities different priorities, and this is one that might change over time. An entity comes in with low priority, but if they had to go through certain processes, <clears throat> their priority might increase, and that will change how they're handled in other parts of the simulation. So you can view these as variables that are local to the entity. And so you can also, when we're talking about state variables, then you can actually kind of think about sometimes implementing state variables as little attributes that are bolted on to individual entities. And that allows each entity to have his or her own state that changes over time, as well as sort of global variables that aren't associated with any specific entity. And so like attributes can be changed with the sim. Entities compete for resources, so hopefully this is becoming more clear, the difference between entities and resources. So resources are the things that live in those processes that keep uh, entities from passing through uh, instantaneously. And so they're the, the things that entities wait on. So they're often people, equipment, space, you know, things that are limited. The, the thing is that, that kind of differentiates is that entities are virtually unlimited and resources are limited. If you've noticed that what you're modeling has something that the limitations are going to cause delays, then that's probably meant to be modeled as a resource, not as an entity. And these are modeled differently in the simulation software. So an entity, we, we often use the term, especially in ARIA, say it seizes a resource and then releases it. So a resource is not, does not belong to an entity, but an entity temporarily holds on to it and has maybe you know, it, its own private access to that resource for a short period of time. So that's you often, I'll use this term later on in the course, seize and release. Um, or in ARENA, you'll see the, the phrase seize, delay, release, where the delay, um, which is uh, sort of a a poor term because we use delay for lots of other terms, but basically means that where I'm going to grab the resource, I'm going to hold on to it for, for a certain amount of time, and then I'm going to release the resource so another entity can grab onto it as well. So you can have multiple units of resources. I can model a single table resource that has a capacity of four. I can model a single airline uh, 
counter agent resource that has a capacity of four. So rather than modeling four resources, I model one re four resource with extra capacity. So in the muffin baking simulation, which you'll see going into lab two, you've got one resource in the oven, but it's got a capacity of 30. It can bake 30 muffins at a time. Um, and so the number of resources can be changed, so you can imagine that um, sometimes the airline staffs four counter agents, but then they might go down to two, and then they might go back up to six later on. So we can actually have a schedule of capacity that we can have ARENA uh, keep track of over time. So any questions about the distinction between entities and resources? Yeah? So basically system like an entity? Uh, yeah, it, at least it's not modeled like it's flowing through the system. Um, so I'll show an example here where the resource um, and entity's mobile status is kind of can be switched. But when you think about it in your model, then the resources are fixed and the entities are kind of coming and going. And so sort of dovetailing off of that, so here's an example from my own research. Uh, so I do some autonomous vehicle research. And so you can imagine as a model for these types of problems, something simple like a Roomba. And so this is an autonomous vacuum cleaner that has to search around a uh, space to find dirt. And uh, it has a bunch of different things that it can do underneath it. Um, in principle, they can respond to different obstacles in different ways. Now, it's the thing that's moving around and the dirt is stationary. So you might think that this would be the entity because it's moving in and out. But if you really think about it, it's actually always there, but it's the dirt that is arriving and then departing, departing by being collected. So, um, you know, it's got a movement pattern, but if I really sat on top of it and like use this as my reference frame, like this cat, from the cat's eye view, the world is moving and the Roomba is staying in one place. And that's the way in which it ends up being the con most convenient way for us to model these types of systems, is to view them as sitting still and to have dirt arriving at a random rate um, all around it. And this thing he needs to make the decision, do I process this arriving dirt or do I wait for other dirt? Because the idea would be that some objects, while you're processing them, you might miss out on others. And so there's an opportunity cost to decide what to, to process at any particular time. So this is an example where you might, in the model, model the Roomba as a fixed resource and entities are arriving. But in the physical system, the actual resource is moving around and the entities are fixed in place. But when you think about it from the reference frame of the resource, it's flipped and it's more like what we were kind of expecting where the entities, are the dirt, is the things moving around and that's why we kind of call them the entities. And it turns out this type of model we can apply um, not only to Roombas but also to uh, autonomous vehicles in the military, autonomous exploration vehicles, uh, flexible manufacturing systems where you've got things moving around belts, um, and, then, uh, and then even uh, uh, biologists have even applied this to understand the behavior of things like wolves and these quail. Um, so in all these cases, we built mathematical models where the resource is the thing that's actually moving, but it's simpler to model it as if the resource is in place and the world is coming to the resource. There are questions about that. This idea, I mean, most of the things you guys will model will probably be the more conventional case where it'll be pretty clear the resource is staying in one place. But you shouldn't think that that's the only way you can have these resources and entities. You can also, it's really what has a limited quantity. There's only one Roomba, and so because it's limited, it's the resource. There's only one quail, and so because it's limited, that's the resource. Any other questions about that? Yeah. You cannot have unlimited resources. Um, you could, you sure, but in some ways, that if I generate a simulation with an unlimited resource, it doesn't make it very interesting because the part of the whole reason we have the discrete event system simulations is that we're going to generate activities as inputs, generate limitations inside the structure of the system, and see how the combination of the limitations and the activity durations generate delays. 
So if you have an unlimited resource, um, so th then it kind of means that the entities are never going to have to wait. Because regardless of how much time another entity is taking, there's just another resource next door. So just go to that other resource and you don't have to wait. So kind of what we're trying to simulate in these systems is what happens when you hit that limitation and you have to wait. And how can we as operations researchers reorganize the system so that we don't accumulate unnecessary waiting times? Does that make sense? Question. What would be the resource in the Roomba? The Roomba is the resource in that example because there's only one Roomba to clean the room. And so it's like there's an infinite amount of dirt and the Roomba's got to decide which dirt to process. So rather than modeling it that way, we have all of this almost like the dirt is walking up to the Roomba and the Roomba is deciding whether it should ignore this dirt because it could better spend its time dealing with other dirt. So if I had a million Roombas, then I wouldn't care about the operations of it. I just let the Roombas go and any random path will work because eventually they'll just probably cover the ground. But if I only have one, then I actually might care about how the Roomba makes its decisions. And so it's the limitation that is the that generates the interesting operations research problem. Other questions? Great, great questions. All right, so then uh, other terms, you know, state variables. Um, so some people uh, post some great questions that uh, over email on the discussions. I posted my answers on the discussion board as an archive for people. So um, if you're ever having a question about an assignment, if you haven't checked out the discussions, take a look. There's already a question there uh, about homework B1, so a clarification uh, there. Um, and so uh, some so state variables. People said, well, you know, I don't understand. Like sometimes you've listed state variables named as the same things as you've listed resources. So is it a resource or is it a state variable? And the important thing here is that state variables are formal variables. They're bookkeeping used inside the program. So we have to decide that when we're, you know, when we're doing our arena program, abstractly on a whiteboard, we can say, I'm a resource and you're an entity or whatever. But then we actually comes down to where rubber meets the road and we have to implement it. Then we have to decide what do we need to keep track of as the simulation's running. And the state variables are a formal variable that we write in the code in order to keep track of something that's changing over time. And so, uh, so that's why, like, let's say, I think temperature in this fabrication process is important. So let's generate a state variable called T that will keep track of how the temperature changes over time. Or I think the number of entities waiting in a queue, I need that to calculate some performance measure later on, like the maximum number of entities ever waiting in a queue. So let's keep track of that state variable. Um, I want to know who's waiting in line. Let's put all of the customers in a list and that who are waiting in line, and we'll maintain that list. So at any instant of time, we'll be able to see who's waiting in line, and so on. The clock, even, the current time, you can view as a state variable, which is used for bookkeeping to ask, what is the current time in this simulation? So that's kind of the difference here, is that these are variables because we're actually, you know, it's like their attributes are variables as well, but very often attributes are static. But you can kind of put some state variables into the entities as attributes. Um, and again, so that's what makes them variables is that they are, we're using them to do calculations. So we can update them at every step. So queue length may or may not increase at every step of the simulation. And we can have simulation logic that respond, responds to them. So we can actually maybe update our arrival rate based on the queue length. If you want to simulate bulking, you can say, well, if the queue length gets beyond a certain amount, of, uh, a certain length, then if someone else comes to the restaurant, they're going to see that and they're not going to come in. So our arrival rate will plummet. So you can have those things respond. Yes. So basically, state variables are kind of like KPIs for your simulation. Uh, well, so uh, so I want to say that state variables are. Again, I want to make the distinction that they 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 only um, they don't accumulate anything over time, but they do. Uh, but they just keep sort of a snapshot of what's going on now. So you might be able to use that in calculations later, whereas a performance measure would actually maybe keep track of a state variable's history over time. So it's just wherever you feel that you need to make use of something in your logic, you probably need a state variable. Yeah? What's the difference between number of entities waiting in the queue and list of entities waiting in the queue? Excellent point. So I should uh, say uh, a number of entities 
waiting in a queue like n might be just equal to 5. And if that's all I need for my calculation, that's fine. But I might need to know exactly who those entities are. So a list of entities waiting at a queue might actually be a data structure that says I've got customer one um, who arrived at time one next to customer two who arrived at time six next to, and then like a list of them. And there might be five elements of this list. But, um, but here I've got a lot more information because I know what order they're in. I know their identities. I know attributes of them. So I can have a data structure as a state variable as well. Um, or if I don't need all of that, then maybe I say, all I really care about is how many. And then I just do that. Okay. All right. Uh, activities versus delays. Hopefully this is starting to get um, a little bit more clear. An activity is a duration that does not depend on the state of the system. Uh, it cannot be predicted, or it can be predicted, before the simulation is run. So somebody can ask you, before running your simulation, how long is it going to take for me to get through the x-ray machine once I get up to it? And without even running a simulation, you can say, well, on average, it'll take uh, 30 seconds, but it's actually a distribution that maybe has some right skew, and you can draw out the whole distribution. Without even running the simulation, you know how long it takes for a bag to get through an x-ray machine. That's an activity. Uh, but a delay is a duration that can change the state of the system. If somebody said, how long is it going to take me to get through all of security? You say, well, I don't know. What time of day? Uh, is it a busy day? Which day is it? You know, they say, well, even then, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to need to run a simulation of that to be sure. And then you'd say, okay, for a simulation that has this arrival rate of customers, that has this number of agent staff, that has all of these different things, I'll hit go, and I'll run 10 different replications of that simulation. And then I'll take stats of that. And then I'll come back to you and say, my simulation says that this time of day, it's probably going to take you eight minutes to get through security. And so I needed the simulation to generate, uh, to figure out um, the total amount of delay. So delays are waiting times that are generated through the simulation. They're kind of outputs of a simulation, whereas activities are inputs of a simulation. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, well, it could be if you got really fancy, but in most of the things that we talk about here, we know it ahead of time and it doesn't change. A state variable is something that can change over time. Now, you might say that, you know, I want this to be sophisticated and I want the average time through the x-ray to change over time because maybe, um, you know, due to certain security protocols, they need to slow down the x-ray machine or something like that. Then you might have state variables which tell me what is the current rate that we push things through the x-ray machine. Um, and maybe during certain times there's more scrutiny, scrutiny than they run the belt slower or something like that. Then you might introduce a state variable. But in the average kind of canonical case of just sort of like, you know, general generic airport, we kind of view an x-ray machine as being the same all the time, so we don't need a state variable. Yeah, if it potentially could change from instant to instant, that's a state variable. Other questions? Yeah, in the back, and then I'll give you a second. Yes. Yeah. No, no. Excellent point. You said it sounds like I defined things differently. It turns out those two are equivalent. Activities generate events. And so you'd say, like, when we say, like, where, where do these events come from? They come from activities that are ending and activities that are beginning. If you arrive at the classroom, you've actually ended an activity of waiting for the next arrival. And now you need to start the new activity of waiting for the next arrival. And so we schedule events based on when activities are, are known to end. And so every activity will be will have two events on either side of it. Does that, does that help? Does that yeah, make sense? We have any problems with the machine. This is an event. Yes. Right. So there can be additional events. So I'm saying that, that at a minimum, activities uh, always generate events at the beginning and the end. But there can be additional events. Uh, but depending on how you model them, you can also think of them as like, like 
how we usually think about failures of machines. We talk about mean time between failures. So effectively, when we will like flip a coin to say, is the machine going to fail at this instant? Another way we could have modeled that is we could have drawn how long until the next failure. And we would simulate the next failure might be two and a half years from now. But if our simulation ran long enough, then we would have an event scheduled in our event calendar two and a half years from now. And there would be an activity that's just running along. And that activity was waiting for the next failure. So every event, I would claim, can be conceptualized as bracketing an activity if you just define the activity correctly. Question. All right, um, so activities may be variable, but their statistics should not depend on system state. So again, activities can be, direct, can be distributions. They don't have to be static. Uh, but a delay of an act of, is often an accumulation of other entities' activities. So you, you know, somebody is currently having their bag run through the x-ray machine. Everybody who's waiting in line has to wait for everybody's activities in front of them, and the accumulation of all those activities are a delay. We have no idea how much the delay is going to be without running the simulation, but once they get up to the x-ray machine, we know ahead of time roughly how long it's going to take to get through the x-ray machine. And so that's known ahead of time, and this is not. Could it be a resources fault? Uh, could it be a, what do you mean by a resources fault? Like, like, a, like a resource uh, goes down or you know, something like that. Yeah, well, so sure. If, so like if the X-ray machine, let's say, for example, the X-ray machine dies, then suddenly the resource is not available. And so that means that you'd have to be rerouted to some other resource, which effectively means you've moved from one queue into another queue. And so you're still waiting for the activity. Whatever resource is still available, you're still waiting on. Now, let's say all the resources go away, then everybody's waiting for the next resource. And then, again, this goes back to then, so if we define the mean time between failures, or we can define, actually, how long does it take an x-ray machine to be repaired? That's an activity. We know that when an x-ray machine dies, that there, it's going to take roughly an hour for it to get repaired then that's an activity that is now queuing up in some other entity's delay. Any other questions? Yeah. Could there be more than one uh, think running uh, simultaneously? Absolutely. Or, or overlaps between different... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So in a lot of these sort of single server queue things, then no, there's not often... A, well, there actually always are. The, the arrival process is always running in parallel to the service process. So a service activity and an inter-arrival activity will always be in parallel with each other. And we'll see that in the example today. So, um, so just, you know, the, uh, so the other sort of, so any other questions about activities and delays? And the other thing that I'm hoping that, uh, that people feel more comfortable with coming up to this point in the class is the use of stochasticity. So the idea was that in these models, the whole point of DES simulation models over some other modeling frameworks is that we're trying to capture realistic variation. So variation in arrivals, for example. Now, uh, a stochastic approach is instead of actually trying to figure out the real reasons for the underlying variation, which would be a very, very complicated simulation, simulating a lot of things that we don't, it would be impossible for us to nail down. We instead use randomness as a surrogate. And so we say that as long as we find the distribution, that if we can pick a couple parameters for, that distribution generates similar variation. So all of these arrival times might come from an exponential distribution of time. And as long as we pick the mean time, then if we just draw from that exponential distribution, we will get variable inter-arrival times that hopefully look like our real system. And so that's, you know, how we're using this stochastic approach. And the process of input modeling is the process of choosing those distributions that adequately capture that input variation. And so uh, the advantage of this is it greatly simplifies our, uh, our simulation because the, the variation that we get for free, uh, you know, uh, from the distributions only, well, it's not totally for free, but it only costs one or two parameters. An exponential distribution only has one parameter. 
So we only have to deal with one thing that we have to nail down in order to, add, to, get, to get all this variation. The disadvantage here is that uh, the outputs look similarly variable as a real world system, so we're going to need replication. We can't just run one simulation. We have to take the same simulation and run it over and over and over again just to make sure that our result wasn't just due to chance. So we actually have to use good statistics. So that's what I'm sort of saying down here. And now that we're running lots of simulations, if each simulation run takes a long time, we want to try to run as few simulations as possible and yet still be able to make an inference. And so we now need to design an experiment to run with all this stuff. So as you start taking more classes in industrial engineering, you should become more familiar with things like DOE, design of experiments. All that that is normally applied to building real things in the real world also applies to running simulations because simulations are just as variable as real world processes and can be just as costly as, as trying to run a real world. So just to kind of summarize that in pictures here, we have, uh, in order to get output variation, it has to have a source, and that's input variation. If we want the outputs of the simulation to look like the real world, the only way we're going to get that variation is if we introduce it somewhere. So we introduce variation. <laughs> this is where activities come in. This is where delays come out. Now, um, if we think about fashion modeling and not simulation modeling, you can say, uh, you know, for a particular outfit, uh, you know, if you want to know what it looks like, you can pick different inputs in order to put that outfit on to see what it looks like. And so the outfit here is like the flow of the system. And the inputs here, this is like the activities going in. And so if you choose bad distributions of activities, you may get bad fits on the other side here. So you may, this may not be very insightful because the, the look of this that may or may not look good to you may have more to do with a poor choice of activities, a poor choice of inputs, than it does with the actual outfit, with the actual uh, simulate, with the actual structure of the model. You, you've designed some amazing improvement for an airport, but you've chose poor arrival rates and so even though your output looks great, uh, it's maybe purely due to the bad choice of arrival rates. And so that's kind of what we're saying here. Insightful outputs require good inputs, and that's why input modeling is so important. But then the other challenge to that is that once you have variation on the input, you're going to get variation on the output, which means we're going to have to run simulations more than once and use good statistical methodology in order to interpret our output. So that's kind of where I want you to be at this point. We're going to go into all the details and all of this stuff in later lectures. But in order to understand discrete event system simulation and stochasticity, um, that's kind of where I want you to be. So that's kind of our recap of where we've gone for, uh, so far. Any questions? All right, so let's um, see uh, some uh, examples of how we actually make these things work. So um, we've been talking about events. So how do we actually make time flow? So this goes into the hand simulations that you've been doing. So what we do, we call this the event scheduling world view. And so the idea here is that events are points in time when the state of the system changes. And we only simulate the system from event to event. We don't care about anything in between events. So once you process an event, you have to schedule the next event or else the simulation doesn't have anywhere to go. So we march through this so-called event calendar or future event list and, uh, until we're finished and that's how the simulation runs behind the scenes. So at each event we update the clock to jump forward to the next event. We execute whatever logic is associated with the event at that clock instant. And then we schedule those future events because if we don't schedule them, the simulation won't be able to move on. So this event calendar is also known, so it's called an event calendar in Arena. It's also known as a future event list or event list in your lecture book. Some people just refer to it as a schedule. When uh, you build these, if you ever manually code your own discrete event simulation software, you'll use a data structure called a priority queue. 
And this priority queue has this feature that it always allows you to quickly remove the first item in temporal order. And then you can insert an item so the list stays ordered. So that the first item is always the first one in the temporal order. So you might schedule an event. It might actually come in front of the next event that you thought you were going to run or behind. But that's what this event calendar is doing, is it's keeping them things in temporal order as they're inserted. Although in your hand simulations, you manually access the event calendar, once you get away from hand simulations, you have to forget the event calendar exists. It is not something you're allowed to access. It's something that only Arena is allowed to access. It is not a state variable. It is a tool that Arena is using to figure out where to go next. But it's good to know that it exists because it gives you an idea of how these simulations are running. So here's a quick um, uh, you know, example of that. Imagine we're modeling a car wash. We have entities, uh, cars. They might have multiple attributes, like color. They might have multiple types, like sports car or economy car. And, they, and the different types or different attributes might require different types of processing. Now the process here is that you arrive at this car wash, but rarely is the car wash right at the street. So once you go into the car wash, you then have to spend a little bit of time driving around the driveway until you actually hit the car wash. So that is, a, we'll call that an activity. Then in the car wash, if it's available, you enter the car wash and it takes a certain amount of time to get through the car wash. We'll call that an activity. Then you travel to another station, and we'll call that an activity, where you can maybe vacuum the car out. And then finally, when you're done vacuuming, you can exit the system. So if the vacuums aren't available, or if the uh, car wash isn't available, you may have to queue up. And so that's where the delays happen. So uh, if we were to simulate this, at the end of the simulation, we would have a record of events that might look like this. So at the, the time the simulation begins, car A arrives, it enters the wash. Sometime later, car B arrives, but car A is still in the wash. So car B doesn't get to enter the wash until a little bit later, and so on and so forth. And so it gives us a timeline of events where some of these events, like this delay between the um, arrival and when, uh, so car A exit the wash. So this is when B gets to enter the wash. So even though B is ready for the wash here, it has to wait for A to get out of the wash. And so this right here will be a delay that we wouldn't have known about if we didn't simulate this system. So that's one of those, those examples. I'll give some uh, more concrete examples in the next lecture. But um, so the basic idea is you start, and the only thing you know that happens is the first car arrives. So that's the only thing on the event calendar. So we jump to that first arrival. Now we've processed that arrival, so we have to ask, what are the next things we need to schedule? Well, if the car A arrived, and we know that whenever a car arrives, it then needs to drive a certain amount of time to the car wash. And we might have a statistical distribution of how long it takes the cars to get from the street to the actual car wash. So we're going to schedule ahead of time how long that's going to take. So we just schedule an event a little bit later that represents this travel time. Now, uh, the next thing is, we, you know, this, this arrival ended one arrival process. Well, if we don't schedule the next arrival now, then another arrival will never come. So we also have to schedule car B's arrival. So once you get rid of one arrival, you need to schedule the next arrival. So you can think again as arrivals, it's ending the activity of waiting for a car. Whenever you end one activity, you can ask yourself, do I need to start another activity? And so you're starting another activity of waiting for the next car. At that point, we're done scheduling. So the simulation jumps to asking, all right, what happens at this later time? It just skips all of this and jumps to what happens at this later time when the car enters the wash. Well, the wash is empty. So we know that we can schedule when the car exits the wash. It takes this amount of time in this activity link here in order to get through a car wash. And so you know, that's when it's going to exit the wash. And then that's all that we have to do. There's nothing, nothing else ended. So the system, nobody arrived. 
um, but nothing finished, and so the system is sort of stuck in that state. Yeah, question. Will the timeline always be linear? Yes, I mean, we're, we're simulating, and uh, what do you mean by, what would be an example of, of what you mean by not linear? Um, like, I don't know, like sequential is something you know what I mean? Like, it's always going to be like one step away from there can be multiple events at the same time. They happen with extremely small probability. So almost always the things you think of that happening at the same time, um, if you zoom in, they probably have a small delay between them. Or they'll be better modeled as sometimes you, you model uh, there was an arrival, and then you have another random variable that asks how many arrived. So rather than simulating five arrivals, you simulate one arrival of quantity five. And so there are different ways we can get at that. All right, so uh, car uh, B arrives. Now here, this is an example where state variables would be important. There would be a state variable that might represent, or at least have a quick reminder to me, that at this point in time, the car wash is busy. I didn't write that up formally here. We'll see that more on Thursday when I do a table example like you do in the homework. But you can imagine when car B arrives, oh, well, so it had, to, it had to drive to the car wash. So that's, I guess, what I missed here. But now that it's sitting at the front of the car wash, the state of the car wash is busy. And so car B can't enter a busy car wash. So all it has to do is wait. And so I am going to add B to the head of the queue. So if I have a queue of all the cars waiting on a car wash, A isn't waiting, it's in the wash. So this is an empty state variable here. And now I'm going to add B to it so I can remember that B is waiting in the car wash. So then I can jump to A exiting the car wash. Well, if A exits the car wash, I know that I have to then simulate how long it's going to take for it to drive to the vacuum. So that's that activity there. Uh, but then I also know that now B is going to enter the car wash because the car wash is empty. So B is going to enter the wash, it's going to be removed from the queue, and then we're going to schedule when B exited the wash based on the activity duration of a typical car wash. Question. So it means that state variables can delay events. State variables can, um, state variables can be used in the programming <coughs> in order for us to sort of generate these delays. The delays just come out of us maintaining this timeline. And so the state variables are just a programmatic tool for us to keep track of things like, is the car wash busy right now? If it's busy, then maybe we can't schedule an event yet. So there might be a logic of when you schedule the next event, and that logic might be contingent upon whether the, the, the state of the car wash is free or not. Remember, the definition of a delay is a, a waiting time that depends on the state of the system. So delays will always be somehow generated by the system asking, is a resource available? That's asking a state variable question. And the state variable will come back and say, no, it's not available. So then that will end up generating a delay. Um, you wouldn't write when the car B <coughs> enters the wash? Like, um, or is it just implied? It's implied by car exiting the wash. But good, good point is that I could, you know, so this writing is kind of a notation that I'm just putting to kind of annotate what's going on. But as you see, like in the homework one, um, there won't be like these annotations. These are like remarks or like comments in programming code. But you're right that if I had more room, I probably should have said car A exits wash, car B enters wash at the, the same instant. Good question. All right, so then you know, then you can imagine this keeps going on forward. Car A enters the vacuum, so it's going to take a certain amount of time for car A to finish the vacuum. So we schedule that ahead. Um, and then eventually uh, we'll then jump to the next event in the list, car B exits the wash. So um, the, the point I'm kind of making here is this is the process you go through in both the lab two exercise and in the homework process. You're just going to keep track of a lot more stuff in the table. Um, and when you're scheduling things in your future event list, um, right now these, nothing, well maybe something has preempted, it's always possible for an event to get preempted by another event. So um, you might have scheduled ahead that this event was going to happen, but something else that happens in the logic here actually ends up scheduling an event here, which is why even if you can think you know what's going to happen in the future event list, you really only can process one event 
in, in the future. Some of you are when you do your homework one, you're gonna look at the future event list and you're gonna say, oh look, I've got an arrival and a departure, another, like you're going to look at the future event list and try in one step to effectively simulate multiple steps in your head and just jump ahead. But you always have to think like the computer. The computer can only go one step ahead and that's for safety because once you start getting multiple arrival processes, multiple service processes, and so on, then you can always get things that preempt other things that come before other things as you go through the scheduling process. All right, so inter-arrival times and service times, um, as you'll see in the homework, these are provided to you in a list format, as well as they're sort of provided in lab two. But in general, this is where stochastic modeling comes into play. Later on in the semester, I will give you, we'll figure out how to generate random distributions where we just then draw from those random distributions. So we don't give you a list of inter-arrival times ahead of time. And practical issues, and sorry you kind of came up a little bit, um, is that you can have very tiny gaps between some of these events and the computer round off error can end up screwing up the order of these things. So you have to be careful if you're operating with events that could be generated with very, very small intervals. And there's going to be other sort of things that you'll get familiar with in Arena, like, uh, you know, Arena is going to have base time units and each process can have its own time units. And if you're not careful about time units, when you schedule things ahead, even though you think they're in order, you might actually be scheduling with the wrong unit. So these are kind of things just sort of foreshadowing of what's, you know, potential problems you'd have in the future, but we're kind of not quite there yet. So any questions about this rough idea of scheduling one event at a time? And then we'll do an, uh, an exercise on Thursday where um, we end up uh, doing effectively what we do in a whole week. All right, so I think that um, what I think I'm going to do since I arrived late here is we'll pick up on uh, most of this on, yeah, I think we'll just pick up on this on Thursday. So let me do an attendance question. Um, so again, if you... Um, you can use the link, or if you don't have a computer, you can bring up a piece of paper. Um, and the attendance question here today is, if, if, if I'm just viewing in terms of durations, if activities are the input of a simulation, what are the output of a simulation? And that's all I've got for you.